Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to another edition of Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks, and in our ongoing effort to be relevant, we're pleased to welcome Larry O'Reilly as our guest on this episode. Now, you may not know Larry, but he's had an exemplary and enviable career based here in Toronto as the person probably most responsible for building out the global network of IMAX film projection, which is, of course, the international pinnacle for watching movies and documentaries in ultra-large movie screens. And more recently, as a pioneer in the practical development of holography, which we'll explain in further detail. But before we get started, I should explain to you that for one of the very first times in broadcast television, our guest will be appearing on stage with me as a hologram. So, Larry O'Reilly, are you there? Yes, you are there, my goodness. So, what do you actually say to a hologram? Welcome to the set, can I get you a coffee? What do you say? You, you say what? Well, you say what it, you normally would say, because you should feel like I'm right there next to you, even though I'm not. Well, let's just be clear. I can see you, of course, and so can our audience, but can you see me from where you are? Absolutely. So I can see you're wearing a lovely vest and a blue shirt and a great check jacket. Well, thank you so much. I can see you, but you are in a different part of the building. You're coming across about as clearly as you possibly could. Could you also be in London or Singapore or Buenos Aires? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I have days where I take a couple of meetings in London, and then I beam into New York and do a few meetings in New York, and then I beam into Los Angeles, maybe do a meeting or two there, and I might finish my day in either Hong Kong or Singapore, I've not even left Toronto. That's fascinating. We'll discuss the science and the applications of holography in a moment, but I want to actually go back to an earlier part of your career when you were with IMAX. Um, I'm just wondering if you always wanted to be in the technology business, particularly as it relates to film and projection, a rear screen or otherwise. Was that a career that you wanted to get into? Actually, I really hadn't thought about it. Um, I, I came into IMAX slightly by accident. Um, I was a fan of movies, um, and I was contemplating a career change, and I was thinking maybe movies, maybe sports, maybe something in entertainment. And my wife and I were down at Ontario Place watching uh, Rolling Stones at the max, and it absolutely blew my mind. I felt like I was on stage with Keith and Mick and the band, and I turned to my wife and I said, I've got to work for this company. And six months later, I was. Well, you know, for those of us in our audience who aren't aware of IMAX, it's actually a technology that is quite complicated, but it's very different from what we would all know as vertical film projection. Uh, no point in going into the minutia of what it involves, but as a technology, it was invented in Canada in 1967. It was introduced at the Seattle World's Fair in 1970. The first IMAX single purpose theater was introduced in Toronto in 1971. Today, there, as I understand it, there are more than 1,500 IMAX theaters in 80 countries. What was your role in helping to build out that whole footprint? Well, my role in building out the footprint really was as president of worldwide sales, but uh, when I joined IMAX, I actually started in the film group. So I was distributing Rolling Stones at the Max and Titanica and a couple of other titles that we had at the time. But uh, we had a business issue, and the business issue was um, we had a consumer experience that people absolutely loved, but the business model was broken. And so we had to come up with a plan B. And the plan B was, at the time, the only place you could see 3D in a theater was at an IMAX theater. A couple of locations, one in Montreal and one in Galveston, Texas. And so uh, we decided we would try to commercialize 3D. And I was part of the team that came up with a plan to 
try to convince the cinema owners that as they were building out these new things called multiplexes, that the anchor should be an IMAX theater. And we would work with the Hollywood studios to develop some t technologies where we could take their very biggest blockbusters and enhance them specifically to take advantage of the picture and sound of an IMAX auditorium. And it worked. And me and my team went from 70 theaters when I joined to over 1,400 theaters when I left. You know, there's no question that anybody who's seen an IMAX film is blown away with the experience. But one wonders what was the whole point? I mean, it's not as if film projection was this tiny little uh, technology that was so restricted. I mean, way before IMAX, you had Cinerama and you had Todd Ayo. What was and is the appeal of IMAX today? What's made it so successful? Well, the biggest thing is if your entire field of view is taken up with an image which is of extremely high quality, and you're also fully immersed in the sound, also at a really high quality, you're, this experience is telling your brain that what, what you're seeing and hearing is real. So it allows a filmmaker to transport the audience anywhere in the world, you know, down to the Titanic, uh, up on the space station, at the top of Everest, everywhere in between. So it, it really allows the audience to suspend disbelief. Well, you mentioned some of those early films, and actually not even early, some of the ongoing films that have been so successful for IMAX. But IMAX, and I think with a lot of your work, started to get into Hollywood and major Hollywood films. What was your role in taking IMAX to Hollywood producers? Well. Uh, I was running film distribution at the time when we first started dealing with Hollywood and the first big movie breakthrough for us was Fantasia 2000, the IMAX experience. Um, it played in 63 IMAX theaters around the world. It did almost a million dollars per theater. I think our, our box office in three or four months was about 62 million dollars. And then it went out and played on over 3,000 regular screens and it did about the same amount of money. So that was an aha moment for Hollywood, you take the IMAX brand and you combine it with the Disney brand and there's a huge audience are looking for that kind of experience. You uh, left IMAX about five years ago and I guess it was somewhat of a natural transition. I mean, it took a couple of years before you got into holography, but you can see the progression. Tell us a little bit more about the the transition for you into this new business and the origins of the business itself? Well, the origins of the business itself was that it was founded by the entertainer Paul Anka and a businessman named Rene Barty. Um, and their goal was to create a Frank Sinatra show for the Wynn Hotel. Um, Tupac had just played Coachella and as, as a hologram, and it was you know, revolutionary within the music industry, and it was worldwide news. Um, unfortunately, their Frank Sinatra show didn't happen at the Wynn Hotel, and they had to move on to Plan B. Um, a few years later, I was uh, contacted by a former sales agent of mine at IMAX, who was based in Brazil, and said, listen, you gotta come and check out this technology. They're doing these huge scale shows with Tony Robbins, and Stephen Hawking and Deepak Chopra, but they can't really figure out a way to monetize and get to scale within the business. Would you take a look at it? And so I came to Toronto and I went to a, a studio that was in uh, on Queen Street and they beamed this guy in from Los Angeles. And I was having a conversation just like you and I were, are right now, and I was absolutely blown away. It was the same overwhelming experience of I can't believe this, like when I saw it at the Max at Ontario Place. And the reality is, for people who experience this technology for the first time, that's how they react. They can't look away. It's just so much better than you would think it would be. You know, the very first hologram that I ever saw was about 10 years ago, I guess, at the Celine Dion show at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. And she was doing a, a, a duet with a hologram of Stevie Wonder at the piano. I mean, it was just amazing. And I remember thinking at the time, boy, that is a heck of a technology they've got there. But 
I wonder what the applications are beyond that. And you can answer that now because that is almost dinosaur technology compared to where holograms are today. Yeah, I mean, hologram technology has improved and the um, presentation quality certainly has improved, which helps with engagement. But really the big point of differentiation for art media is our software, which allows us to take these large data packs and encrypt them and compress them and send them anywhere in the world in less than 0.3 seconds or less. So that when you present an image, a moving image of an individual, and they look lifelike, life-size, in 3D, without the need for 3D glasses, and there's no latency that's noticeable in the audio, your brain is telling you that they're in the room with you. We call that creating presence. And by creating presence, you actually create an experience that's not almost as good as the person being there, but in fact, oftentimes is better and more impactful than the person being there in, in, in person. So it allows us to create uh, solve business issues on a whole host of, of verticals. So we're focused professional services, they travel nonstop, we can reduce the need for them to travel. They're still gonna have to travel some, some, sometimes, but you can engage with customers, you can connect with them, you can teach them things, you can consult with them, you can do business with them, all holographically because of this two-way communication. And we do it in financial services, we do it in education, we do it in entertainment, we do it in the technology industry, and, uh, and there are all kinds of other applications as well. So I could be a university professor in London, let's say, and I could be speaking to a theater of students in Melbourne, Australia and giving a lecture? Absolutely, and in fact, we have uh, universities that are doing that right now. You know, we have a, a display at American Samoa Community College in the South Pacific, and they have regular classes taught by professors from the University of Hawaii who beam down to the South Pacific and have two-way interactions with their class and run the courses that way. We actually have a clip that I know that uh, you've isolated for us that kind of shows exactly this kind of presence. Just uh, lead us into this clip a bit. Tell us what we're looking at. Yeah, this was a conference that was last year in Vancouver, and it, our client was Sun Life. It was a benefit com uh, conference, and the SVP of benefits for Sun Life was unable to be in Vancouver. However, the EVP, Kevin Doherty, was in Vancouver, so he was live on stage, and he beams in his colleague, and let's take a look. Hey, Dave. Hey, Vancouver. Hi. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? <laughs> Is that yourself? <laughs> This is myself here <laughs> with you in Vancouver on stage. Welcome. That's uh, it's great. It's great to see you. This, this this works out really well. Where are you? I am in Toronto, and we should tell your audience this is another one of those demos where I'm like not real. Yeah. I'm actually really here on stage with you in Vancouver as well. Wow! Wow! Well, it's, it's it's fantastic. You're looking well. I'll just say thank you to everybody in Vancouver. It was awesome to join you on stage. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Kevin. So where is this technology going? Where is it going to be, say, in 10 or 50 years? Well, I'm personally am concentrating on the 10 years because 50 years from now, Jim, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> I hate to break it <laughs> to you. That makes two of us, but, Larry. But there, there, there you go. But um, no, it's evolving quickly. But really, you know, the beauty of, of the good news that's come out of COVID is that it's forced organizations to embrace technology to communicate with one another. And they don't necessarily have to get on a plane to have a meeting, an internal meeting within an organization, or you know, break bread with the client six times a year. Well, maybe you break bread with that client once a year, but instead of talking to them six times a year, you can talk to them very effectively every day if you want to, or every week or whatnot, in a very impactful way. So it reduces the need for travel and, you know, organizations just before COVID hit at Davos, the number one topic was how do we reduce the carbon footprint? CEO after CEO went to the microphone and said, we will be carbon neutral by this date. And I can tell you professional services companies, you know, the big accounting firms and things like that, over 80% of their carbon footprint are flying people to meetings. So you still need to fly to meetings to break bread with somebody, but you just, 
uh, now you can actually communicate with that person on the other side more frequently and with equal impact. So what other negative impacts might there be though on other inter industries? I mean, I think of literally the business travel industry. If everybody in 10 years is going to be appearing by hologram at conventions and meetings and so on, there aren't gonna be a lot of flights, there aren't gonna be a lot of hotel rooms booked and so on. Do you think of other negative impacts that might happen? Well, you know, as I said, there already was a focus on trying to reduce carbon footprint by, by reducing, and reducing travel is just one way to do it, obviously, but it's a very measurable way um, to, do, to do it. Um, and I think that not just holograms, but frankly, COVID and Zoom and all the streaming platforms are forcing organizations to rethink their corporate travel. Um, I know in my case, when, when I was at IMAX and I was running the global sales team and we would have these conferences and my CEO and I would be going through the list, this person doesn't need to be there, this person doesn't need to be, and they all could justify actually going somewhere but, or, and actually being there. But it's, it's uh, brought into focus that business can continue without the need to get on a plane as often as we were. So tell me a little bit about your company, A. RHT Media. What does the acronym stand for, first of all? Well, the acronym stands for Augmented Reality Holographic Telepresence. And what kind of projects are you working on now in early 2021? Well, I think the biggest new, new product that we've just launched is called the Holopod. So we have on the display side um, a, an event type display that is portable. Um, I, you're seeing me on that right now. Uh, we have a, a five foot wide version and a 10 foot wide version and a 30 foot wide version and we can do anything custom as well. And, and, and we do. Uh, however, uh, the company was really focused on being in the events business in the past. Where we're going directionally is really, we're looking to replace the high end of video conferencing with something with much greater impact. And we can do so at a very cost effective way of doing it by having permanent installations. So our clients that have been purchasing our Holopresence display were saying, we would use it more often if it was simpler to operate and maybe in a cabinet where when we weren't using it, we can kind of roll it out of the way and put it back into position, make it a little more plug and play um, for a university professor as an example. And so we just launched the Holopod last month. The very first unit is at the University Health Network in downtown Toronto where they're looking at actually networking their expertise, which is on University Avenue, to hospitals all over the province. Is your company unique or do you have competitors throughout the world? Well, there are certain aspects of things that we do that other people do, but we are the only company in the world that are really focused 100% on live presentations. We do pre-recorded presentations too. Sometimes there's a reason, time zones or whatnot, where somebody wants to do a presentation and they're not available at three in the morning for some reason to speak in somebody in, in Singapore. But, but we're really focused on live. The other thing is we're the only company that does this on a global basis with a global footprint. We have a, our headquarters in Toronto. We have a studio in New York. We have a studio in Los Angeles. We have one in Hong Kong. We have one in Singapore. We have one in Seoul. We have one in London, uh, we have one in Tel Aviv, and you know, the list is growing and, and, uh, and expanding quite quickly. Now you told me that, or you mentioned a minute ago, that Paul Anka was very much behind the origins of this company. Tell us a little bit more about how he got involved, and I should mention, of course, to our audience that Paul Anka is a fellow Canadian. Paul Anka is definitely a fellow Canadian from born in, in Ottawa. Um, but has been based in Los Angeles for quite some time. And uh, no, he was a co-founder. He saw opportunities in the music industry. And obviously, you know, when you write a song like My Way, you've got a little bit of a Rolodex. Um, so he was a, a really much fo very much focused on the entertainment sector. There are companies that specialize on doing holograms related to specifically for the music industry. And, you know, you've heard about the Roy Orbison tour or the Maria Callas tour or some other entertainers that are deceased where they have an actor who plays that person and they're lip syncing to original recordings and oftentimes play with a, a live uh, music uh, orchestra. However, 
that's the entertainment business, and it's really the expertise is on touring and concerts and things like that. That's not our expertise. What we're focused on is trying to solve business problems for the executives in all areas of the world that are in constant demand. How do we make them more efficient? How do, you're not efficient when you're sitting on a plane for 12 hours flying to Hong Kong from Toronto. Um, you might take in a couple of movies, you might get a, get a little bit of work done on your computer and the whole bit, but I live that. I, I, I spend more than 300,000 miles a year living on planes um, when I was in my IMAX days. I'm much more efficient today. You've been with Art Media now for about three years. What's the most satisfying achievement that your company has made? I mean, for you personally. That's a good question. Uh, there, you know, there's so many moments, um, and, and I think for me as the CEO, it's just seeing the team come together and really be on a mission. Uh, we really have a sense of purpose that we're changing the way people communicate, and it's hugely beneficial to those individuals. And at the same time, it's beneficial to the world from a, a carbon footprint perspective as well. So, you know, we're, we're helping clients in a whole host of different ways um, and different applications. We, you know, we do events that are just kind of mind-blowing. Last year, you know, the, the um, Crown Prince of Dubai was the host of the World Government Summit, and we did a hologram of him giving his speech about the seven trends of future cities. And one of those trends is that in the future, there will be avatars of ourselves that you can actually send to meet uh, do meetings or socialize with friends and, and that sort of thing. And so consequently, it made sense that he gave that presentation as a hologram. And the mandate from his people was the audience can't be able to tell that it's a hologram. The audience has to believe he's actually on stage delivering it. And it was from in front of 5,000 people, 80 heads of state on national television. And at the end of his speech, he comes out from the side on the wings and actually walks out and shakes hands with a bunch of these government leaders. They actually thought he was delivering the speech. Incredible. You know, we've just... That was very cool. We've just come through Christmas, COVID Christmas. You know, a whole situation that we never would have envisaged a year ago, but uh, for so many families across North America, well, around the world, families have not been able to get together. If you beamed forward 10 years from now, would families be able to get together in their living rooms through holograms? Do you see that actually happening? Absolutely. Now, the technology will continue to evolve on the display side. Our, so our software would be, is, would be able to enable it today, you know, and it'll only keep getting better because it does keep getting better. And I think people will socialize that way. And, you know, there are times when, A, you just can't be there at that time because you have a conflict or there, there's a pandemic. Um, I know in my own case, you know, my, I, w I had planned to visit my parents who live in Calgary at Christmas and they called me just before and said, you know, the pandemic's raging here and we're, we're a little older, um, you know, the, the, the uh, vaccine is coming, let's postpone our visit until we're vaccinated and uh, we'll be able to overcome those situations. You know, we had, I had a client uh, last year who we were working with on a project and she came in and saw the technology for the first time and went crazy. She said, oh my God, she said, my husband's birthday is next week and my daughter's in LA and she's applied for a green card and she can't come. And my son lives in London and he has a young family and he can't come. I mean, your technology could have done it. And so she had a private dining room, about 15 guests. We set up a small holographic screen. We beamed people in from London. We beamed people in from LA and the family were together. It was bloody awesome. You know, I'm going to ask you one last question that I ask all my guests on Canada Files. And in your case, you have traveled around the world many times. Um, you've met many important and influential people, obviously. You're representing Canadian ingenuity and achievement. What does being Canadian mean to you from all this experience? It's a good question. I mean, the, the reality is, uh, if you're a Canadian, you're generally welcomed anywhere in the world, probably more so than almost any other nationality. You know, we have a reputation of being fair and honest and decent. You know, if you're American, maybe a little bit boring, they might th think we are. 
but but we're polite, and, and you know, and we're we're noted for being unfailingly polite, um, but also sincere. And so I think that uh, you know, personally, I'm extremely proud to be Canadian. Um, I've worked, as you said, go around the world. Uh, my job at IMAX was based in Los Angeles for a number of years, and um, I always felt the the pull back to Canada, and uh, getting off at Pearson. It uh, doesn't matter where I've been, I always feel pretty darn great. Well, Larry, you're clearly on the leading edge, and uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken to share with us today. And I don't mean to be rude, but you can go now. Thanks, Jim. It's been a pleasure. And he's gone. But I want to thank you, too, for joining us today, and I uh, hope we'll see you again soon with more Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of the North Pine Foundation as well as the following donors. The Browning Watt Foundation, Nona MacDonald Heeslip, Joe and Marie Heffernan, Michael and Mary Ellen Hogan, Donna and Richard Ivey, Alice and Ted Kernahan, Richard and Gail McGraw, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the 63 Foundation, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.